Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joy, joyous song, and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the sound of melody. Make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Our Father, we thank you that we can be here uh, today. And Lord, as we uh, have a special emphasis today on the ministry of Camp Moses Merrill, we thank you for all those from this congregation, uh, Craig and Brad and Bob and others that work up there. And we thank you for the ministry of that place and pray your blessing upon it. Thank you, Lord, for all your grace and mercy to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. I have a number of announcements. Uh, today, Bob uh, told me uh, just a moment ago that the, uh, there's a bit of misinformation on the screen that the men's breakfast is on the 12th. Well, it's on the 11th, that's uh, Saturday. So please take note of that. And also this afternoon at five o'clock, the prayer meeting, uh, but uh, there are some other announcements. Uh, Jan uh, Erickson, would you come up please? And then um, following Jan, uh, Grace has an announcement to make. Sign up for that out in the um, Narthex area there or uh, contact Shirley Horseman about that. Thank you. The flowers that are up here are from the memorial service for Connie Dowding. Psalm 100 says this, make a joyful noise to the Lord all the land, serve the Lord with gladness, come into his presence with singing, with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Let's stand and join our voices together in praise.
Okay, first I, I want you to pretend that you're at camp and we're sitting around a campfire. So you can sit back down, <laughs> stay standing choir. <laughs> they need to see you because the piano's in the way. Uh, so uh, uh, today's music is gonna be uh, performed by the Second Baptist Rhythm Band, and that's you. So don't worry, the only instruments you need are your voices and your hands. So on the first song, we're just gonna clap. And you can watch the choir, they'll try and help you. And the second song, And on the third song, we're going to snap our fingers, alternate fingers. Again, we'll see how much rhythm you have. Follow the choir, but we'll do our best. Remember, we're at camp, so just have fun. Of course, now I have to get my music out, so. OK, so clap on two and four. One, two, three, four. Keep it up. the spirit in here this morning it's great got a few people missing over here it looks like but you're making up for it in enthusiasm and praise the Lord for that welcome this morning I want to share in a few time a few moments of prayer and I think we are all grateful thankful today that we did not have loss of life no major serious injuries from the terrible tornadoes 
that hit our area uh, this last week. Uh, I know that we had some close calls. I think uh, Johnson's were probably the closest call there, about a half mile from where uh, uh, they had a lot of debris in their yard or some debris in their yard, and uh, barn was destroyed just a half hour, half mile from their their house, and they spent part of the afternoon in their crawl space. <laughs> and uh, we're very thankful that, uh, and I know Bill got a few good uh, pictures, much to the, the Chagrin of his fiance wasn't real happy about him standing out there. And I explained to them that men look at this differently. When they, it talks about a tornado watch, that's what we, do. we want to go out and watch. <laughs> so, you know, that's kind of what it is. But uh, anyhow, I, I'm just very grateful that there were, was not any, uh, any more serious uh, injuries and so on. And uh, lot, lots of loss of property, but things can be rebuilt. And... Um, but we do want to pray for those people that are having to rebuild. Uh, it's nothing to, you know, n- nothing to diminish at all to, in saying that um, there's no loss of life. But nevertheless, it's going to be a long, long time of rebuilding for a lot of those people. Um, we want to continue to pray for others who have been on our prayer list for some time. And uh, I want to lift up uh, several people today. We want to continue to pray for Joanne Shaw and Dave uh, right now and just pray for them uh, during this difficult uh, difficult period of time and uh, we've got others uh, Barb Chappelle uh, is struggling with uh, arthritis and thyroid issues and we want to continue to pray for her uh, I want to continue to also pray for um, uh, Daniel Romery who is recovering from the surgery that he had last week um, are there any other prayer concerns that we need to remember today? Yes. Um, we lost Dr. Sprinkle uh, yesterday morning, actually. He was a yes. dentist at Bob Ryan's practice, mm-hmm. and uh, he's only, I think, 61 years old. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And uh, I have, I'm not sure of the diagnosis, but he has some stomach problems, mm-hmm. and he's also pneumonia and diabetes. And, yes. Yes, yes, thank you. Yes, we want to remember uh, Dr. Fritch's family. He was my dentist as well, and, and um, we just uh, want, to, want to pray for his family right now. Um, this is, he's been in the hospital. He was in the hospital for over a month, and they just, you know, all kinds of things going on with him and uh, just didn't, didn't uh, make it, and we're, we're saddened about that, but want to pray for his family right now. Um, are there any other prayer concerns? Yes, Ranin? Okay, let's pray for Ranine's granddaughter, Stephanie, um, who, who uh, uh, tested positive for, for COVID. Lord, hear our prayer. Pastor? Yes. Kathy Schock, uh, her house was hit with lightning, and she also asked for prayer for um, physical healing. Yes, let's remember Kathy. Kathy is normally here on a Sunday morning and a wheelchair, um, and she has um, had lightning strike her house, and so it's affected some of the garage door opener and a few things like that that's suddenly not working, and so let's pray for, for that situation. Lord, hear our prayer. Pastor, I have a praise. Michelle and uh, Ashton were in Omaha, and she calls me and says, Grandma, get to the basement. They're making us go downstairs, and I said, "Well, the sun's shining here." Yeah. But anyway, they had to they had to stay for a while, but they got home fine. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, that is a praise. I know our our uh, uh, daughter and son-in-law and and grandbaby were all in three different places in lockdown, uh, <laughs> you know, and so they were kind of worrying about each other and everything else, and so. But uh, let let's give us let's give praise for that, Lord. Hear our prayer. Let's go before the Lord in a time of preparation, of a prayer as we come before the Lord and what he has to provide for us today.
Father, we come into your presence today, Lord, seeking you. We come here by the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, to, to honor you, to reflect upon your love and your grace in our lives. Father God, we, as we enter into worship today, we come with great gratitude for the sparing of life this last week in this tornado. Yet we also remember those who have lost all of their worldly possessions, swept away in the windstorm. And Father, we just pray that you'll be with them, that they will find and have the assistance that they need, Lord, to recover from this. And God, I just pray that you will continue, Lord, to be with uh, others, Lord, who may not have the resources uh, to, to recover, that you'll provide for them. Father, we lift up today those who have lost loved ones. We think of, of uh, the several people in our congregation uh, who have lost loved ones, but we also remember today the family of, of Dr. Fritch. We just pray that you will be with them, Lord, as they grieve his loss at a young age. Pray, Father, that you will uh, provide the emotional support for them in the days ahead. And God, I also pray, Lord, for Daniel as he continues to recover from the surgery. We pray for a good healing for him, Father, that he will be able to regain uh, the usage and so on as, as Lord, we are, are grateful for the surgery, but we also recognize, Lord, that he's had to give up his athletic uh, career. And we just pray for him as he deals with that, as well as a, his, his parents at this time. We also pray for Barb as she struggles with arthritis and thyroid condition. We pray for Alan as he continues to recover, Lord, from his uh, surgery a few weeks ago. And Lord, we also pray today, Lord, that you will continue to be with um, uh, Stephanie, uh, uh, Ronin's granddaughter Stephanie, who, is, uh, who, who has been diagnosed with COVID. We pray that you will be with Kathy Shook as well and pray, Lord, that she will, uh, that you will help her in her home situation uh, as the lightning strike took place there. We're grateful, Lord, that there wasn't further uh, damage and injury in that situation. Lord, we give you praise. We give you the glory for bringing us here today to celebrate you and to celebrate our camp and the work and the ministry that's going on there. And our deepest prayer, Lord, is that as young people and older people alike visit that camp and sit under the teaching of others and can re rest and relax, Lord, that in that time they will experience you in a fresh way. Bless us now, Father, as we continue in our time of worship. Lord, guide us as we uh, repeat those words that you taught your disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
The book of Philippians tells us that the name of Jesus is the name above all names and that the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Stand and sing. First, the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things 
will be added unto you. We're going to receive our tithes and our offerings at this time. Let's give generously to the Lord. Father God, we do thank you, Lord, for blessing our lives to the point of overflowing. You've given to us all things, Lord, your Holy Spirit to guide us, your Son Jesus to die on the cross for us. And Lord, you have created all things. We thank you, Father, for all that you are. And Lord, we pray that as we serve you, that you'll help us to be good stewards of all that's been given to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Today's scripture is Matthew 17, 1 through 9. It's on page 973 if you would care to uh, turn to that. The Transfiguration. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright light cloud enveloped them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. 
But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. God bless the reading of the scripture. I love the mountains, and I know some of the rest of you in here enjoy the mountains too. I know the Wilcoxes do and love to retreat to the cabin in the mountains. And uh, my whole life, we've been going uh, to the mountains, uh, usually out Glacier National Park has been our favorite place always to go, and that in Grand Teton National Park. And uh, we were a little too far from Colorado to go to Colorado ever as a kid, but um, nevertheless, uh, we see God's great and beautiful creation at its highest degree when we go onto the mountains. Maybe it's the experience of seeing the clouds floating by when you're up above the tree line and you're, uh, you can actually look down upon, upon the, the mountain meadows. Maybe it's the thin air. Uh, whatever it is, I feel simply closer to God when I'm in the mountains for some reason. But I've discovered that getting to the mountain is quite often times difficult. Grace and I like to go to the mountains and so do our kids. We don't hike anymore. In fact, we haven't even been to the mountains in a while. It's been too many, probably at least 10 years since we've ventured out that way. But when we were doing more of that, if we couldn't drive to the top of a particular mountain, we would hike. Usually these mountain trails are uphill but, and smooth at first through the forests. And then pretty soon you start to climb above the tree line and that's when it begins to get more difficult. As we get further and further and it gets more steep, there are more rocks and there's more roots to stumble over, it becomes more and more difficult to keep good footing. And when we are the most tired and the trail gets to be its roughest, and the last 100 yards are quite oftentimes, for me, the most difficult of, and, and more difficult than the first mile of the trip. Mountaintops are great, but they're hard to get to. And in the same way, the high points of mountaintops in our spiritual lives, in a metaphorical sense, are also very difficult to reach. We face this every day of our lives. We know that in our own experience, there are spiritual high places, and we always enjoy being there, where we find a closeness to God that we don't find in the ordinary moments of life. But it's hard to get there. Some of you have had those moments atop the mountaintop experiences and feeling especially close to God. Maybe it was at a camp retreat. Maybe it was a time in your life when you experienced a, a movement of God in a very special way. But those experiences are not only hard to reach. They don't always last very long either, do they? Because the realities of life circle around us and, or circle back and we face them once again. It seems like we have to go through a lot of trials and, and tribulations, or the, sometimes the ordinary things of life or the mundane experiences of life to ever get to those times of refreshment and renewal in our lives. But in those moments, when God's glory is revealed to us, we feel closer to God than other times and we are given a new perspective on the, 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 those special moments in our lives. Jesus' disciples knew the truth. It was a rough trip to the Mount of Transfiguration for them. What, what was read this morning was at the end of some other traumatic things that had just taken place in their life. Their journey to that mountaintop of transfiguration began when Peter confessed that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
When Jesus said to him, Peter, who do you say that I am? And, and G Peter responded by saying, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus ex exclaimed to them that the son of man must go to Jerusalem to die. And then on the third day, he would rise. And Peter just couldn't fathom the idea of Jesus dying. And he says, Lord, I would never let that happen to you. And of course, Jesus spoke back to him and said, get behind me, Satan. And that's kind of the way human beings think, isn't it? The disciples probably felt like they had been kicked in the teeth when Jesus told them of what was about to happen. They were looking forward to a kingdom that he was to establish. And them being at his right hand and them serving him and them seeing all the marvelous things that he was going to do. And instead, he's talking about his death. It's like a person who's been diagnosed with cancer, a, a close relative or friend, and we find out that they've only got weeks or months to live and, and how that affects us as we hear this terrible news. The account of the transfiguration begins with the phrase, six days later. For six days they carried this news of Jesus' impending death. They carried it with them, around inside of them, and for six days it, it soaked into their souls. They secretly grieved for the inconceivable idea that Jesus was going to die and leave them alone. What would they do without him? How would they ever make it? And so for six days they walked in this days between denial and acceptance of the most unacceptable news that they could ever hear. But then, it says, on the seventh day, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, prominent members of the group of disciples, he took them up to the mountaintop. And I got to thinking about this because Jesus had been off by himself before. He had been to the mountaintop before. Maybe not this mountaintop, but he had gone off by himself for a little time alone and he always went by himself and it was just he and his heavenly father. This time he took his three, these three disciples with him. It was on that seventh day that the glory of God was revealed to them. His clothes, that is the clothing of Jesus, glowed. There was a heavenly light that, that shone from him, it says in Scripture. And that wasn't all. It wasn't just Jesus that, that, that shone brightly, but suddenly there was an appearance of Moses and Elijah as they appeared to him. And the two greatest prophets of God, right there with Jesus, and then the cloud overshadowed them, it says, and a voice came from heaven that said, This is my beloved Son. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Maybe if the disciples could hold these two truths in balance somehow, maybe if they could remember Jesus the Messiah suffering and dying, and, and Jesus, the Son of God, high and exalted, maybe that balancing act could help them understand or at least cope with what was about to happen. Maybe the vision of his glory and the voice from heaven could help them deal with the trials of the past and the future to come. Maybe it would give them strength to lead the other disciples in their trials as well. Moses had appeared on a different mountain, didn't he? A long time before that, many centuries before. And maybe the disciples pondered this incident later on as they were remembering Moses had appeared before God on another mountain. It wasn't easy leading God's people through the desert after the exodus from, from Egypt. They were, the people were always complaining, talking behind Moses' back or grumbling 
You know, who made Moses king anyways? Why is he telling us what to do? Or, or maybe we should go back to Egypt. At least there, we had, we had meals to eat. All we eat out here is this white stuff called manna. In the 24th chapter of Exodus, it says that one day God called Moses up to the mountain. And when Moses arrived on that mountain, a cloud covered the mountain. And for six days, sound familiar? Six days they had no vision, no visibility. Both physical and spiritual blindness, zero. And the worries of being the leader of a nation of escaped slaves plagued Moses like the waves of frogs and locusts that had plagued Egypt. For six days, Moses sat in the, the shadows of the clouds, wondering, where was God in all of this? Has God abandoned me? <clears throat> Has God left me alone? Why did God put me in charge of this obstinate mass of people in this extremely challenging environment without food or water, how are we going to survive? Is this really what God had in, had in mind? Is this what God planned? But then, on the seventh day, the glory of the Lord appeared to him. It was like a glorious fire on the mountain, it says in, in the 24th chapter of Exodus, that, that made the burning bush look small. And the voice of God came out of the cloud and God had been there the whole time, in the cloud no less. And, the, and, and for 40 glorious days and nights from that point on, after God appeared, Moses listened to God's counsel and he basked in the, in the glory of God. Maybe if he could hold on to that vision, maybe if he could remember the almighty glory of God, that he could handle leading that group of Israelites through the wilderness. Life, especially the life of faith, is an, is an uphill journey for all of us. There are rocks and there are pits in the trail and at times it gets, it gets very steep for us as we walk the road of life. And as we trudge up the trail, we're, we're met with disappointments, we're met with doubts. And even though we have confessed Christ as our Lord and Savior, it gets difficult, unmanageable at times. And we're troubled by doubts and dilemmas. Why does God let innocent children suffer? <clears throat> Why does God allow faithful people to die, to die of cancer and other terrible diseases? Why do tornadoes come, destroy people's property and life? <coughs> Why does God let the suffering of the world touch us in such deep ways? Why does God let me suffer? But then the seventh day comes. The Sabbath day, the day of God's choosing. What then? Then the glory of the Lord is revealed to us in new and powerful ways. On the seventh day, Jesus stands transfigured, glowing, with the heavenly radiance right before their eyes up on that mountaintop. And on the Sabbath day, the voice of God speaks. Speaks out of the cloud itself. I don't know about you, where you are in your life. Perhaps you might be in a valley of darkness right now. Maybe you're, maybe you're at the top of the mountain, or most of you, I think, are probably somewhere in between. Maybe you're just coming down from the mountain. Remember, we can't stay there forever. Peter wanted to, but he couldn't. Life does have its challenges. Both for children and adults, the stress of life weighs heavily. 
This morning we're focusing on the work and the ministry of Moses Merrill Campson Conference Center. It's a place that is near and dear to our hearts. As uh, Richard commented at the beginning of the service, we've got a couple of guys who go up there every week. Craig Erickson and Brad Pope go up there every week. We have others who have gone up there and worked and served over the years in various ways. Bible camps have been a huge part of my life. Since I was a small child, my parents were going off to camp and serving, and I was sometimes a tag-along a kid. And then as I grew up, I went to camp, and then as I became an adult, our children, as Grace and I led camps, our children were tag-alongs for us. For 18 years, Grace and I served at a camp in North Dakota. And I think people underestimate the importance of a Bible camp. Like the disciples on the mountaintop with Jesus, they, they went there weary. People go there weary. People go to our camp discouraged. Children and adults today face all kinds of discouraging and exhausting circumstances in their lives. Look once again at verse 4. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will even put up three shelters, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. And we can stay here. Peter was all ready to build a retreat center, wasn't he? He wanted to stay. I can't, I don't blame him. He wanted to get more of the much needed refreshment and solitude from this experience. He wanted more of Moses, more of Elijah, more of Jesus. And it caused his soul to sing as he was on that mountaintop. I know so many times I've heard men at men's camp, show up there for the first time, maybe. And I've heard him say, you know, I faced some challenges lately. A job has been stressful. Family situations have been stressful. I'm tired and worn out from my work, and all of these stresses are mounting up. And they say, I almost didn't come this weekend. I had other things to do at home. So many things to take care of with my job, but, but I ended up coming here anyways. <coughs> I'm so thankful that I did. God has been speaking to me today. God has been speaking to me through the other men here at the camp. And God has been healing my soul. I was moved by what the speaker said. I felt love and support from the other guys who are in the room. It is good for us to be here. Christians face stresses today. I should say children have faced a stress today that I've never uh, experienced in my life. Broken homes, cultural stresses all around, peer pressure, self-esteem struggles, fear that somebody might come in and shoot up their school. There's anger with children and, and, and emotional pain due to all kinds of stresses. And sometimes kids show up at camp feeling alone and broken. They wish their lives could be different. And by the end of the week, after hearing their peers talk at campfire, after hearing answers from scripture, after being affirmed and loved by a counselor and, or the other staff, after sensing the presence of God, the week ends much differently than it started. And at the campfire, at the end of, at the last night of camp, as, the, as they hear others' testimonies, as they sing around the campfire, they give their life to Christ. They commit to following Jesus. 
And they look around at the group who's gathered there, and they see everything that's going on. Like those disciples on the mountain, they say, it's good for us to be here. In the 1890s, there were no child labor laws. Children were working in, in, in factories in the inner cities. There was smoke and smog in the cities of America that was so bad that it was hard to breathe. And children were forced to work long hours in these sweatshops and these uh, selling, vending things on the streets and so on. And, and they often developed respiratory conditions due to, to the impure air. And along came the Salvation Army. And they pioneered in developing something called fresh air camps for urban children. And families around, for, and, and for for children around the turn of the last century. <clears throat> Their stated aim was to redeem the lives of the poor. The organization established the first, very first fresh air camp in a series of 20 tents in Kansas City's Fairmont Park in 1897, not that far from here. The first known Bible camp for girls was the Young Women's Bible Training Movement. It was later named Camp Pinnacle, and it was founded in New York in 1898 and overlooked the Hudson Valley. It seemed to me that camping really took off, however. For most of us Baptists, it really took off in the, in the late 1940s, right after World War II. Most of our regional camps started around that time. It's provided that mountaintop experience for children to come to know Christ as their Savior. It's the opinion of most pastors that I know that, you know, as well as our region leaders, that the best ministry a region can have is a camping program. Bible camps are expensive to operate. Many regions across the country have sold their Bible camps. They're not, they don't own their camps anymore. Maybe they lease from somebody else, or maybe they're not doing camp at all. Camp Moses Merrill is not without its own financial challenges as well. Things are expensive. This last spring they had to put in a new well because of the nitrate levels in the in the, the, the in the soil or in the water from their old well, things are always breaking. Tractors are breaking down. Uh, equip, all kinds of equipment. The kitchen needs to be remodeled. The whole dining hall is being uh, going to be renovated this coming year. We aren't the only church that has trouble finding younger families. Churches across our region are struggling finding younger families. Athletic camps have become so popular that parents are sending their kids to athletic camps, making athletes out of them rather than following G followers of Jesus. And their children are dropping out of Sunday school, and we're seeing that more and more. Kids are going to sports camps as opposed to Bible camp where they can meet Jesus. Yet in the, even in the midst of these challenges, our camp at Moses Merrill is a bright spot. Men's camps, women's camps, pastors' conferences continue to grow in popularity. Not many people go away from these camps thinking, well, I'm never going to do that again. <laughs> Almost always, it's, it's good for us to be here. In August, our Men's camp is going to be held. I made it a personal goal <clears throat> to bring 10 men with me to camp this year. I believe that's, I'm, that's going to happen. I've already maybe got a half dozen uh, or more uh, who, are, who have verbally committed and going. Many of you have never seen our camp. Many of you have never been to women's camp or, or men's camp. Many of you think, 
well, that's not really my style. Or I don't know what to expect if I go there. I, 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 am I going to like it? Others think that they can't afford to go. But I'm going to ask you to take a risk. To step out in faith and plan ahead and put those dates on your calendar and make sure you do it. Set it aside on your schedule. It involves a Friday afternoon and a Saturday morning with great sleeping accommodations. And I'll say the same thing to the women because theirs is coming up in October. Take a risk. Go in faith. Set aside the time and, and plan to connect with other people. People that are just like you. Coming there stressed out with a lot on their plate thinking, boy, I really don't have time to do this. I have too much to do at home. But they do it anyways. And in the end, they walk away saying, it's good for us to be here. Amen. Amen. We're going to close today by singing 326 in your hymnal. Uh, the words will be up on the screen in front of you. Today, if you do not know Christ as your Savior, if you've never received Jesus into your life, I hope that you will pray quietly where you are today and invite him to be your Lord and Savior. If you'd like to join in the membership of Second Baptist, again, I invite you to come today as we sing these la this, last, uh, this last song together. Let's stand together as we sing. Thank you.